Thank you, Laurie. It's really a pleasure to be here. And um, today I'm going to talk about the uh, possibly seismic change in the way we compute that's coming through the arrival of non volatile memory. Hopefully, it won't be as bad as this, but it might be as dramatic. Uh, I also am kind of inspired by the room. Uh, I noticed there's a lot of you know revelation and prophecy going on in here, so uh, so I'm you know sick. Uh, I, I'm in the role of uh, prophet here, warning you of the coming of um, something important. Um, so the usual link on the disclaimer, which is you know don't believe anything I say and don't assume to buy into it. Um, Let's go into the uh, overview. So over the, today and tomorrow, I'll be uh, this kind of, this is the agenda for the three hours. Um, one thing I'm going to do is talk a little bit about some just hardware historical background. And I'm just curious, if any of you, any of you do actual research in hardware? Okay, one, okay. Um, I, I feel like much of this stuff I discovered in the last year, right? entering this area and I found it really fascinating and I thought, well, you might find it fascinating too. And if you don't, well, you know, and you select in, you're not going to miss much. So, um, so then we'll talk about um, how this hardware manifests itself at the software level um, and then uh, talk about the promise of this new uh, way of storing things, uh, but more importantly, the difficulties of using it and the challenges, which is not what you would find in the you know, marketing materials. And then my own topic has been trying to figure out how this might apply to Java, which is a, you know, one of many different languages it could be applied to. So I'm going to share some thoughts about how I've been thinking about that. And um, you know, my goal in all of this really is to get at least one of you uh, convinced that this is a good research area um, and, and actually do some work. Because at the end, I'm going to list, I think, uh, 10, maybe a dozen PhD topics um, that spring from this. So, um, uh, also because of the nature of the area, there are many more questions than answers. Uh, and, and in fact, I'll be asking you questions and will not be proceeding until I get answers. So, um, some will better, better put me on. And the biggest caveat is the, this is all um, initiated by the recent release of some Intel hardware. I've been reading manuals for a year, but I haven't actually got my hands on any hardware yet, so stuff might be wrong, uh, incomplete, etc. You know, we'll figure that out as we go along over the coming years. So let's start with some hardware technology. Um, let's start at the very beginning. So this is probably the first picture that you ever saw as an introduction to computer science. And uh, it only has a couple of elements, and it's actually now wrong, because they really look like that. Um, but the important thing here is memory is, is at the center of all of this, uh, and is in the center of all that we compute. And so the properties of memory are uh, really essential. We would like our memories to be uh, cheap, um, because we want lots of them, we want them to be large because we are lazy and we want to store a lot of stuff without having to compress it down, and we want them to be fast. Um, the unfortunate part is you only get to pick any two of those in any individual technology. You can't make all three of them happen simultaneously. So instead, you know, we've developed uh, a set of techniques to present the illusion of uh, large, fast, and cheap. And this set of techniques has evolved over the last 50 years or so into kind of this picture. So uh, we have a, the pyramid represents the scale. So, so the bottom is the stuff where the, the pulls the most stuff in the, in the cheapest way. And at the top we have the fast, small versions. And there are some interesting discontinuities in this picture. Uh, specifically, you know, registers are in addressed completely differently from, from memory because we want to have our own. We have not very many of them and we don't want to waste bits in doing that. Then we have a, a large chunk of stuff addressed uh, as memory at the word level. And then below that we transition to a completely different way of talking to our storage media, transfer, transferring blocks at a time. The typical way we organize stuff there is by putting things in files. 
Notice also that that kind of green line discontinuity has another important property, which is that it's the distinction between volatile memory and non-volatile memory, i.e. Uh, the stuff that goes away when you turn the power off and the stuff that keeps its data when you turn the power off. And this, uh, this is more or less a coincidence that these two things lie at the same line. It's kind of essential that the stuff below the line be non volatile, um, but it's been a coincidence that the stuff above the line has been volatile. In fact, if you go back far enough, and I think as the oldest person in the room, <laughs> yeah, Tony and I can deep this out, but I don't remember the machines with core stuff. Okay, the, the great deal is, uh, is a good one. Uh, so way back when, way back when, machines had little magnetic rings that looked like polo rings inside that held, uh, each one held a bit. And when you switched the machine off, they continued to hold memory, except as far as I knew, no one actually exploited this property because they were so small, it didn't really matter. Um, but as long as everyone in this room can remember directly, um, memory has been volatile. And that assumption is kind of baked into a lot of what we do. So notice that um, also that we do two different kinds of things with what I'll call storage, the stuff below the line. Uh, we have the files that we store all the non-volatile stuff, but we also use it as a volatile extension to memory by paging. So another technique here is, you know, our RAM isn't big enough every once in a while we might want just a little bit more, and rather than having to force people to go out and buy some, um, you know, stop the machine, plug it in, etc., we allow them to swap stuff out to disk, but we treat that stuff as volatile memory, even though it's in a non-volatile medium, we wipe it when the machine gets rebooted. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about DRAM and uh, non-volatile RAM circuit technology. So, um, for 30 years, 40 years, DRAM has been the dominant um, memory technology. The D stands for dynamic. Well, I hope you know what the RAM part stands for. Um, and uh, we built them out of silicon, on silicon chips, and this is roughly the circuit diagram of one DRAM bit. So we have a wire going left to right, which picks an entire word, the wire going from the top to the bottom, which picks um, a bit from the word or a bit from all words. And then the cell itself is basically a, capac uh, a switch, which is a transistor, and a capacitor, which is the storage medium. And when uh, the word line switches on, uh, the bit line can be used to either write to the capacitor and store electrons there, or drain the electrons off, or by switching it on just a little bit, you can sense kind of what's there. But when you sense, you kind of also lose some, because, you know, observation requires some amount of perturbation. And uh, that's basically how it works. Um, the digger... Uh, I'm looking down, it's not because I'm playing Get Enough Words with Friends, it's because I'm looking at my notes. Um, <laughs> so the original design uh, in cross-section is shown on the top right, and it was a very planar kind of thing. There were, everything was laid out very flat, and so if you sort of squint, uh, you can see uh, a correspondence here. The bit line, the font here is this font right but the bit line is over here. And the word line is here, and every place you have something like this, you have a transistor. So they actually use uh, the, the, the boundary between um, the two kinds of silicon as the transistor, and uh, it's a very small, compact structure, but still not small enough. So as um, geometries and densities have increased, the orientation has switched more to something like this, which is a vertical structure things in very time. And th this is the corresponding diagram, it's actually two bits in one cell. So the capacitor has the property that it leaks. Uh, the electrons, while confined in the cell, have uh, some small probability that they will uh, tunnel through the sides and will leak away. And in a modern cell, um, 
the number of electrons stored in one of these things is around between 10 to the 3 and 10 to the 4. So it's not a huge number of electrons and they leak at a reasonable rate. And so after typically order a second, you really don't know whether it's a 1 or a 0. <coughs> and so there has to be a separate process implemented externally to this cell that on a regular basis checks to see what value is um, and then writes it back, storing a full capacity of electrons. And that's called refresh. Uh, and it's one of the reasons that um, DRAM requires power, even when you're kind of not doing anything with it. Uh, and it's also the reason why um, when you switch it off after a short period of time, it's, it's kind of all gone. So to give you some idea of dimensions, uh, this picture, the, the 3D picture, is fairly recent. Um, the cube, or the footprint, here across this area is about 50 nanometers. What's the wavelength of light? Again, what? Yeah, 400, 500 nanometers. So we're talking about a structure whose basic dimensions are about a tenth of the wavelength of light. Uh, and yet it's built using optical lithography. Which, I'm not going to tell you how that works because that's a whole lot of energy. Um, the, the individual silicon atoms, anyone know the size of a silicon atom? There you go. 0.2 nanometers. So there aren't a lot of silicon atoms in this structure, and the electrons are bound around the silicon atoms, and that's... So one of the problems here is, they're not going to get a whole lot smaller, because you know, quantum effects and the uncertainties mean that you know, at some point you end up with enough noise and leakage that either the refresh interval basically goes to zero, or um, you just really can't tell whether, whether it's a, a, a one or a zero because there's just not enough electrons to discriminate. Um, okay, it's really all I want to say about that. Just as an aside, um, we build our processors and our um, memory chips separately. Why is that? Why don't we just put them on the same die and have them talk to each other because they're next to each other? Well, so how many RAM chips per CPU chip in a typical system? Guess, order of magnitude. 16, 32. Well, yeah, like 100, typically. So, um, so one of the problems is you, you'll never get enough because you need 100 chips if to have enough data to feed one CPU chip. But fundamentally, the, the, the big distinction is they're optimized for very different electrical characteristics. And the processes are basically incompatible. You can't build aggressive DRAM on the same die that you build um, a modern CPU chip. And so uh, there are essentially two industries. The ones you guys know about, which is the processor designers who build processors, and the one that you probably know very little about, and I know very little about, which is the DRAM processors, because you know you have no real reason to talk to them. Well, all you need to know is you know load and store works. But it's all it's all completely electrically different. And uh, one of the interesting economic things is that CPU manufacture is your typical sort of high margin economy. Uh, but DRAM is not. Uh, being in the DRAM business is extraordinarily painful because all of the companies operate on razor thin margins which oscillate with demand. And so here's a uh, picture of the profitability of Micron, who we'll hear a little bit more about over the last 10 years. And uh, it kind of half of the time it's below and half of the time it's above. Yes? How much of this is from price fixing? How much is How much of this is from price fixing? Um, because I've heard the so, so when, they're, when they're doing well, it might be due to price, price fixing. Um, and there are certainly historically have been a number of attempts for DRAM manufacturers to do some amount of price fixing. But if, if you integrate the area under this curve, it's basically zero. Um, uh, right uh, when this graph was published, my DRAM was a, a, a uh, price high and very expensive. Uh, there isn't the historical data ends around the uh, middle of 2018. Any guesses as to what happened after that? 
pointing the curve. Um, <laughs> exactly as you might expect. So DRAM prices have crashed in the last three months, and it'll be interesting to see what Micron's financials look like at the end of the year. But it's 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 a tough business to be in. So in contrast, we have storage, which is the sort of generic term I use for for, for the existing non-volatile uh, storage media, which uh, is non-volatile, large, cheap, and above all slow. And uh, as I mentioned, transparently used as volatile storage to expand space, but also as um, uh, file storage. So uh, here's another question: uh, Who knows Amdahl's second law? or sometimes known as Amdahl's other law. The first law is the one about parallelism. Anyone? God, you professors are really slipping up. Um, <laughs> so Amdahl's second law says that to build a balanced system for each uh, instruction per second that you can execute on your processor, you should have one byte of memory and one bit per second of I.O. bandwidth. I'll let you think about that for a bit because it's not totally obvious. How does that translate into reality? So here's a picture I drew. It's not, take this with an extremely large grain of salt because all I did was think back to a handful of computers I've used, you know, look at the numbers and plug them in here. So this is not like an average survey over all of computing. But it does show the trend that I want to explain, which is, uh, so at the top, there are actually two lines that are superimposed one on top of each other, which is that um, the ratio of RAM to MIX has roughly been one uh, over the entire history. So I'm, I'm approximating here, it's like plus or minus 50 percent, but it's, it, it draws the, uses the general idea. And so there, that balance has been maintained over a 30 year historical period, and you'd probably expect that to happen because RAM and CPUs are built out of the same stuff, silicon technology following the same Moore's law, however, so as they evolve, they evolve together. Uh, however, our storage is built out of different technology, uh, originally, uh, you know, spinning disks, and that zone has been, was on a different curve, and SSDs are on a, a different curve, and the, the spinning disk thing, actually, I think, is easy to explain. So, um, and this is about bandwidth, remember, not capacity. Capacity has gone up with aerial density of disk recording. So, like Moore's law, it's been an aerial growth where, as you shrink the size of the bit on the disk, the, the, the growth is in the square of the linear dimensions. Um, so, capacity has been following that. The bandwidth, however, has been following basically a linear path. Yes. So, just to clarify, you say that um, the speed of I/O speed is not been keeping up with uh, processor speed, yes. uh, including speed of communication with RAM. So I'm thinking about the raw bandwidth of the disk here, and in practice, of this, but not, but, but not communication with all the hardware. Right, right. right. In, in, imagine you you can pull as fast as you want. I mean, the, the rides have kept up, so the, the RAM speed is not a big problem. Okay. Um, the problem here has been that, uh, in effect, uh, uh, storage has been this kind of ever-increasing lake that we put more water in, but you still don't have a straw to suck things out of, which was fine when it was just a glass, but now that it's really big, is a problem. And as I said, that's fundamentally, I think, due to the fact that read speeds are due to the linear density of bits on the disk, and not the area of density, and so they don't follow the same uh, power. Are you only considering um, rotating storage here? So the rotating one is much easier to explain. So yeah. uh, the SSD growth, the SSD growth is uh, the bandwidth is a much more difficult thing to characterize than what we try to do there. Right. Yeah. But, but, the, but the bottom line here is we have a, a discrepancy mm -hmm. and the law has been sort of getting progressively unbalanced. Now you can always deal with this in some ways by just kind of adding more disks and striping, but you know then you have to figure out how to stripe your data and that doesn't always Think about you know arbitrary applications doing random reads and writes. It's really about the bandwidth to an individual device that matters. And you can mitigate that a little bit, but not fundamentally. So we really need something to fill in the gap. And 
uh, we're lucky in that something is coming. Um, and it's been coming a long time, or well, people have not realized it's been coming. Back in 19, early 1970s, 1970, 71, uh, Leon Troyes, who was uh, a professor, <coughs> Uh, looked at um, the theory of circuit elements and drew some pictures and did some inferring, inferring and noticed that if you look at it from a symmetry perspective, how the various fundamental equations of circuits relate the different kinds of elements, you know, resistance, inductance, capacitance, there's really a missing one. Um, you have you know, the, the Ohm's law, Kirchhoff laws were relating other things, but there's a gap in the bottom right. And so he spent some time thinking about what that might look like, reasoning only from the symmetries of the equations, and came up with a, a new name for a new device called a memristor, and explored what that would have as properties if it had the right equations by arguing by symmetry. And the conclusion he came to, and, and the reason he called it a memorista, is that the uh, property of the device um, would be that it, it has some memory, some record of the state it, it had been in to get to the current state. And in particular, it has this property known as hysteresis, which is that uh, as you vary the voltage, the current, you, know, you go around this loop, basically, depending on how you uh, draw the inputs. And so, uh, when you're at a specific voltage, you could be in one of two states. Or if you drive a specific current, you could be in one of two different voltages. And that gives you the ability to discriminate between one state and another state, and that's the fundamental, the basis of, of, of memory at this level. So he said, this is cool, you know, there's this thing, uh, it, it would make the diagram all pretty, um, it would have memory, you know, I'll call it the memorista, uh, pip, published, everyone forgot about it. It's like, that's nice. Next. Um, so that, that then sat, you know, in the IEEE archive for um, a few decades until about 10 years ago at HP, there was a group investigating uh, nanomaterials of various different kinds. And we're doing experiments on these nanomaterials to, to try and characterize them. And after a while, they, they thought, you know, we can't understand what the hell this stuff is, because it doesn't seem to follow any patterns that we recognize. So they spent a while looking at this, and eventually, one of the people uh, kind of stumbled across this paper and thought, hey, this looks just like the material we've got. And indeed, it turns out that memristors is actually uh, really only becomes uh, a viable property at very small scales. And so in the 70s, the geometries of the devices that you, could build, you couldn't build in Memristor, it requires a much, uh, a much smaller uh, scale to exploit the quantum effects that, that are required for this. And so they said, hey, we've discovered it, it's here. Uh, we know how to build one. And so there was a, a publication and a lot of, um, uh, a lot of excitement around it. You know, they did picture in the graph shows the hysteresis curve that was more or less predicted. It's, it's probably, actually, I think the only example I can think of IT of sort of scientific prediction and discovery. You know, um, if, if you can think of another one, I'd love to hear of it, but um, this one's remarkable in that respect. So, um, and this is the paper. I actually have recommend this. It's really good read. Um, but that kind of opened the door and then uh, a lot of investment flowed into the area of looking at uh, very small devices that could exploit this property but also other properties which were by then reasonably well understood but people hadn't spent a lot of time figuring out how to build memory. And so there have been a whole bunch of different approaches. I'm not going to go through the slide, this is just a few different uh, basic technologies that have been exploited, but they're all, I would characterize them all as um, Exploiting some property of a material to give you that hysteresis curve and some, some amount of, you know, a one bit or small number of bits of storage. And the, uh, they all have the property that you don't need to maintain a current or a voltage to, to maintain the state, so they're all non volatile. So the, the trend and the, 
the direction is clearly to see that uh, these things bring come to market. This is a picture uh, from Intel of their technology, obviously just a sketch. But it gives you some idea of, of the, the way things are implemented. Instead of having a complex structure with a capacitor and a transistor, which requires, you know, uh, for each bit, like 5x the basic geometry in each dimension, so you get kind of one, one bit for every 25 square units of space of the basic geometry. This one is much smaller. You're only talking a few units because it's, it's a, each of these things is, is a storage element. So this is actually two bits per column uh, with the word lines in the middle, the bit lines horizontally or vice versa. Uh, and, and the property of this material is what's used. It's not a, an electron storage property that's used. And so um, it gives us the promise of uh, much higher density and non-volatility, which from the uh, angle uh, law graph we really need. So uh, this is something whose time I believe has come. And uh, unlike the uh, DRAM structures, this is likely to continue scaling for whatever Moore's law uh, we have left. And DRAM structures are such that uh, we currently have 16 gigabit DRAM chips. Kind of no one has managed to successfully build a 32 gigabit one now. Uh, it's getting right at the limits of what's, what's doable. Yes? Is there any drawbacks of this uh, memory server? Sorry, what was there? drawbacks? Because, for example. That's the rest of this talk. <laughs> <laughs> That's the rest of this talk. Okay, so um, so there's a circuit technology. Uh, it it, need, it seems like it's needed. Uh, it's coming. How do we use it? That is the next part, or at least uh, what, what's coming uh, at the low level, and how is it used? So, are there any questions at this point that require me more? Okay. So um, the industry as a whole has been kind of preparing for the arrival of this technology. And uh, one of the ways that uh, that's taken shape is that um, various uh, different consortia of companies have been getting together and going, well, we should really figure out how we're going to package this stuff up so that everybody can use it to kind of make a bigger pie and have it available to everybody, rather than competing on all of the different individual interfaces. Uh, and making things incompatible. And so for the last seven years or so, a consortium called uh, SNIA, the Storage Networking Industry Association, has been trying to draw rough pictures, architectural diagrams, and have them agreed by all the vendors participating in this, so that when finally NPM comes around, there is a, a, a model that they can use. And, and I'm going to save a lot of tedious reading by summarizing the whole thing in this one picture. Uh, and actually, it, it's a pretty obvious kind of picture. There's nothing terribly earth-shaking in any of this. Uh, the interesting parts of the picture are about what, what it doesn't cover rather than what it does. So the idea is in this architecture, at the bottom we have a non-volatile memory um, packaged in uh, DIMMs, which are the sort of standard package of, of memory technology that we use for DRAM. And then above that, you have uh, several different access uh, nodes. Oops. And some circles on that one. I don't. Basically, going from uh, left to right, you fake that you have a disk, and so you put in a driver that partitions this memory up into blocks, and you put the usual file API around it and you hand it out, which is straightforward but not terribly exciting. And then on top of the blocks, you put a file system, and over on the right, you get rid of all of that intermediate software and you present it just as memory. So it's like, well, yeah. Kind of, how else would you do it? Um, so, so, so that's the, the picture, um, but it doesn't really tell us very much. So, we the again, there's two pins where it's where it says scattered file. What is the difference between? Sorry, there's two things where it says. There's, there's two things at the top where it says scattered file. What is the difference between them? Okay, so on the block side, you're going through a file system. That it's just a standard one that doesn't know that it's on non-volatile memory, so it will do copying every time it accesses a block. And then to the one to the next one is a way that it's sitting on persistent memory, so it eliminates the copy because after all, it's memory. So, so direct access to the 
No, that, it's, it's still a file system, and you still access it via a file API, the but the underlying driver is doing additional copies. The, the, the copies taking place between the file system and the user space. Presumably, you can also generate that file as a So that's the thing on the right. That's how, when you use it as memory. And we'll, that's the part we'll get into in detail. So, sorry, I'm going to try to Sure. So, so the user space memory is also <coughs> one of the time memory. Uh, we'll, we'll get to that. No, the, the, the short answer is maybe yes, maybe no. <laughs> <laughs> so my next question is going to be, how are we going to, is the vision of combination of volatile and non-volatile? Uh, we'll get to that. Uh, it's complicated. <laughs> okay, so let's look at a concrete technology. Um, and, and this is really the thing that has driven the work because uh, we've, you know, Intel announced this a few years ago and they've been working to make it available. Um, they have released uh, at the beginning of last month um, these modules, uh, this is not life science, they're actually about this big. Um, uh, these modules, which are called, the, the brand name is Optin, the DC, I believe, stands for Data Center, although I couldn't actually find that anywhere in the marketing materials. Uh, I'm certainly not direct from it. Uh, yeah, I think it's Data Center. Um, persistent memory modules. And the underlying circuit technology that they've developed for this, which is actually, I think, comes more from Micron than Intel, uh, has been known as 3D Crosspoint, and that's, that's this stuff. Uh, now, um, so that came out uh, as a, a released product uh, last month, so you know, you can call up your Intel rep and hand over a big lot of cash and they should send you one. Uh, but of course, you have to have something to plug it into. Uh, to make use of it, and it requires uh, some new interfaces and some new uh, new support, uh, which I'll enumerate in detail. So you actually have to buy a new computer, you can't plug it into an old one and have it work. Uh, and the particular generation that they've also released in April is called Cascade Lake, and that supports this particular memory technology. As I said, the chips themselves, I believe, are made by Micron in one of their fans. Uh, there's all sorts of fun to be had by looking at up websites like the Register to see how Micron and Intel are fighting with each other. Um, but I'll, you know, let's skip that. Uh, one interesting question is, I, I had the slide with all of these different circuit technologies um, that have been developed over the years. You know, what, what's inside this? Well, they're not saying. Um, basically, you know, you don't need to know. We, we keep that secret. Um, and uh, at some level, it doesn't matter, but it's kind of curious. So, uh, what are the properties of these memories compared to stuff that you know? Um, well, the individual chips are 128 gigabits of storage. So, compare that with the biggest DRAM, which is a practical DRAM chip that's available right now, which is 16 gigabits. There's an awful lot more bits on the same chip, same size of chip. And they assemble them into DIMMs of between a half a terabyte and an eighth of a terabyte. Um, and uh, these DIMMs, as I said, have just become generally available. I haven't had my, got my hands on a system containing one yet, but a number of uh, people have, have had access to them, in particular a group in San Diego uh, has been doing some evaluation of these uh, systems uh, before the release in collaboration with Intel, and on the day of the release they published this paper, which is referenced here, which is kind of, you know, basic characteristics. Interestingly, Intel hasn't released any of this stuff, so um, it's a little bit puzzling that you have to go to a third party to get all these basic statistics, but that's the way it is right now. Mario? Yes. So, no, 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 no. Is that, is that for the, um, what, what interface, or is this an initiative of the what interface, or are they using the direct access? So, so the, uh, the chip technologies have been in Intel SSDs that you could buy yeah. for the last two years. Yeah. I'm not talking about that. This is the RAM interface. Right. This is all the non volatile RAM. Yes. Right. Yes. Uh, the, the block technology stuff is of lower performance as you might expect because the software in there. So um, the, RAM, the non volatile RAM has the property that it, you know, it behaves like a dynamic RAM, except it's a little bit slower to read. Uh, better factor of four, basic read latency. Uh, and the read bandwidth is uh, about a third of that of 
DRAM, and the right bandwidth about a sixth of that of DRAM. We'll talk a little bit later about the writes because that's, uh, that requires some knowledge of the internals. Yes? One more question about the endurance. Do you have to um, spread the uh, writes? I, I will slide on that, yeah. So the endurance, if you look at it, basically when you buy one, they, they give you a five year warranty, and they don't say, you know, don't write it. So, um, so, so, you know, they're either going to go bust or, or these little modules last for five years. And I have some basic calculations which suggest why that might be uh, uh, okay. The, the, if you look at the circuit technology papers that are most likely to be related to this, you know, they haven't said what kind of circuit technology is in here, but people have been reading in between the lines based on some of the properties. The circuit technologies that are closest have an endurance of about 10 to the 8 rise, which, you know, your first reaction is 10 to the 8, that doesn't seem like very much, you know, that's like, you know, seconds, minutes. Um, but I'll explain how they translate that into something that's actually useful. Yes? I just to remind us that. So this is slower. Than yes. So how much slower is this? Well, so it, it, it's hard to compare because you can't do random routes of a bike in SSD. Uh, you have to go through a block interface. And so if you layer a block interface on all of this and you have software in the way, obviously it's going to get slower. Um, but the Octane SSDs are uh, a little bit faster than flash drives. Not massively faster, because you have all this extra stuff in the way, um, but um, kind of, they're pretty good. Yes, one question I'm getting. Five years is way beyond like the normal decommission window. In like most cases. Yes. Yes. And like 10 day, it's like you know, most of the time you're just reading and caching anyway. Mm -hmm. So what if there's like a certain amount of playfulness in the numbers that they have? Yes. Like, you know, we'll just give you numbers beyond how you're going to use this anyway. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Um, so the, the the bottom line is the price. You know, how much does it cost? Right now, it's only been out for a month. Uh, depending on which module size you get, you pay uh, on a bit per bit basis about uh, a fifth to two fifths that you would for DRAM. So you're getting an awful lot more on a single device at less cost than the many devices that would, would be required for this amount of storage. They're currently charging 40% for the big ones, which of course all of the, the commercial people want the highest density, and so they'll pay the premium for the big ones. I would expect that ratio will drop over time as the technology gets out. That's usually a little bit with semiconductors, you know, you, you get the the early adopters who are willing to pay the most to pay as much as they're willing. And then over time, when you've got those guys uh, dealt with, then the prices come down to attract other people. Note also that this is a, a data center technology. Uh, these dead rounds go in motherboards. Uh, it's probably going to be a number of years before uh, stuff like this arrives in your laptop. Okay, so uh, how does it inter? How does Cascade Lake embrace this stuff? What, what do you need? So you get a Cascade Lake system, which has one of the new CPUs in it, and here's a sketch of uh, uh, a CPU, this green thing in the middle, which has two memory controllers, the little green things inside, and each little memory controller can talk to six sockets uh, in three channels, and the sockets are ranks, first rank, second rank, and you can only plug the persistent memory in the first rank, you can't plug it in the second rank. They're actually electrically different. So you can plug, physically plug it in, but it, it won't work. Um, so you can have up to six uh, modules that are persistent for each uh, Cascade Lake socket, and you would accompany that with uh, some number of DRAMs. Notice that you have to have DRAM. You cannot have just persistent memory. So the valid configurations Intel gives are on the right, and those are the patterns that you have to use when you plug stuff in. So each one of them has some amount of DRAM. Uh, and this works out as uh, three terabytes per socket of persistent memory. Um, the biggest uh, Cascade Lake system currently released is eight sockets, so that's 24 terabytes of persistent memory. Sorry? Question, there's a question. Oh, oh, sorry. Okay. Um, why is so many DRAM? I'll get to that. <laughs> it, for, the obvious thing is, well, it's slower. Um, but there, it's actually more complicated than that. Um, okay, so this is a picture that kind of is meant to appeal to the SNEA diagram that comes from Intel, and this is the operating uh, sort of, kind of 
architectural characteristics of the, the persistent memory. So at the bottom you have uh, a module and you can put it in one, you can partition it and you can put each partition in one of two modes. One of the modes is called memory mode and in memory mode it uses the associated DRAM on the, in, on the same memory controller as a cache, a front side cache for persistent memory. And so it's a way of basically making bigger flat memory, but mostly uh, reads and writes at DRAM speeds. But you can't use it as a persistent, usefully as a persistent, persistent thing, because you have no control of when the caching writes stuff back. So when you write data in memory mode to one of these partitions, it will first go into DRAM, and if you pull the plug, well, it's gone, you know, because it was in DRAM. Um, so that, uh, that to me is, you know, that's, a, that's a, a sensible thing to sell because people want more memory and this is a way of giving them more memory with a little bit of a performance penalty, but isn't interesting from the point of view of developing non-volatile languages and systems yet. Is it trivial to just add some procedures, you uh, flush it to uh, the first in RAM uh, before you cover up or something? Uh, you have no visibility into the operation of that cache, so there's no mechanism use to assure yourself that it's in your system memory. To get in that mode. In that mode. If you want to do stuff where you know about the system, you have to do it in the other mode, which is called app direct. <laughs> <laughs> um, so app direct mode basically takes away that front side cache and gives you quote direct access to the uh, non-volatile memory, and then, then when you write, um, you can be assured that stuff is persistent. It's a little complicated to we'll walk through how that works. So um, it's called app direct, but it's actually not really direct. There's an extra level of indirection inside the modules, which basically says when you write the cache block back. Uh, the controller on board is going to say, is keeping track of which things that parts of memory have been written to, and it's going to do where that one So it's going to put that block somewhere that's been used the least and set up a table that says, okay, block number 26 is over there at location 63. And that gives them the ability to spread the writes. No matter how you write, they can spread them over the entire chip. And when you do the arithmetic, uh, look at the fastest you could possibly write to this uh, and uh, do that for five years it's, it's way shorter than 10 to the 8 write cycles because the thing is so physically big once you spread writes over you, know, you, you, can't, you can't hammer on any individual location anywhere near the, the, the number that would uh, cause it to fail. Now of course some will fail simply because well they're really small and really small stuff is hard to make reliable uh, and so there's bound to be some, uh, some amount of spare, spare capacity on the board that gets mapped in when, when something fails. Um, but that's, uh, it's sort of indirect direct. Uh, and the writes go into a buffer that's a dynamic buffer when you write. So they're fast. The write latency is low, but it's buffered. Okay, so um, how would you actually use this? And I'm going to go from, kind of from a bottom up perspective, building up uh, on the various mechanisms that are provided. So um, right now when you get one of these things, it's supported by uh, uh, extensions to Linux and Windows, basically uh, drivers for file systems that do <coughs> the right kind of characteristics. And initially it just looks like a disk. You plug it in, you partition it, you put a file system on it, and uh, you can store stuff, which is great. So how do you actually use it in memory mode? Well, that's NMAP. You pick a file and you map it into your address space and the driver for that file system ensures that there's no uh, copying taking place, it's direct access. And um, the acronym you'll see around the OS is, is DEX, which is just stands for direct access. So the life cycle of use will be you create what I'm calling a region, a piece or a whole file in this file system that's intended to contain persistent data. You attach the region using MMAP and it becomes in your address space. You read and write to it using loads and stores and all the other memory modes that are available in your processor. 
and then you detach it by closing and you know, when you come back to it in a minute, in a day after a reboot, it should all still be there. And of course you can do stuff via a file system too, but it's more interesting to think about it direct memory mode. Get some more water, otherwise <coughs> this is going to go to an abrupt end. Um, so now we have the modified picture and a previous property that the stuff below the green line was both non-volatile and block-based and the stuff above it was volatile and word accessed. Now that's changed because we have a non-volatile thing that's accessed by words and it coexists with DRAM. The stuff above that, the caches, are all just the same as they used to be. They are all volatile. Um, when you turn them off, all that stuff disappears. So how do you achieve durability in this sense? Obviously, you know, that you write some data or you modify something and you say, I know this is going to be here when the power comes back. How can you be certain of that? To do that, you have to use uh, at the lowest level, various Intel instructions. There's the usual memory write that you do. Of course, when you do that, the cache hierarchy is the same. The data will be resident in a, a volatile cache. So that certainly isn't durable. And the system might flush that back out to the non-volatile memory. But you know, if you just rely on that happening um, without checking, then, then you're going to get bitten because one day the power will go off and the stuff that hasn't been written back will be there. The, the updates will so instead, you, you, what you have to do is you use an instruction that uh, writes the cache line back to memory. And there are actually several of these in the Intel architecture, but the previous ones all had uh, properties which were not ideal for this. So they've recently added to this one, which is kind of the one you would like to use rather than the other, which is cache line write back. And that, when you execute a cache line write back, you give it an address, and the cache block can, containing that address starts making its way out to memory. Um, at, but you continue execution as it's making its way out. You can tell when it's done by executing a fence on that address, and uh, at that point, yes? I've been trying to understand this system. Does it actually wait for the asynchronous or is it just a bit like the, the thing you have in the supermarket you put between your stuff and your... The fence? <laughs> yeah. The, is it just an order? So, so, so it actually going to wait for so, so in terms of a, uh, a hard legal, you know, I could sue Intel because my program doesn't work and it should work, it's really hard to know because I haven't updated the manuals as far so as I can tell. The, the, the fence description doesn't talk about non volatile memory at all in the manual, which is kind of problematic. But it's my understanding that I think you actually have to initiate another write after the fence. But if it hits persistent storage, you can break off the fact that the previous thing actually also hits persistent storage. That's not the way I read the literature. You, uh, I, I need to you, you may be right, but yeah. the way I've, I've read uh, both the stuff coming out of Intel and the other people who are like sifting through the rooms trying to understand this is that the fence is everything. Uh, but but I'm, I'm like I said in the beginning, like, like I said, I, I, I haven't tried it, so it's not that low story order. So, yeah. so the good guarantee is not in fact. That that's that's my understanding. Yeah, uh, I understood it was just an ordering thing, all that, all that, this is so, and so a second write still isn't sufficient because yeah, it's not that complicated. But you only really know by examining the state as to whether those writes actually. But what state? But what state would you examine? Right. Well, it's a it's a commit record or something if you like. Okay. Get pull it out of cash. Let's let's. I want to talk about this more up up one. So pictorially, I'm going to try and summarize what's going on. On the left, I have a CPU socket containing caches. Imagine the CPU is off here, off the screen to the left. And a memory controller, and all memory controllers have some kind of queues that they maintain. And on the right is the non-volatile DIMM connected over a DDR channel. The green stuff is the non-volatile memory. The red stuff is volatile. And on the non-volatile DIMM, there is logic and buffers and stuff here which are volatile. So when you start, you, you do the write, uh, then you execute a CLWB and your modified data starts making its way over to, uh, to the NVDIM. You don't know exactly when that's going to happen. 
but when you execute, at least the way I read the Intel documentation, when you execute the S fence, you know it's there in the module. It's made it to the dip. That's, that's what you're guaranteed. And then at some point after that, the module finally flushes that buffer and writes it into the NVRAM, and uh, all is good. And I don't see a problem with this. Yes? If the cover gets dropped somehow, uh, and then the writes in the right buffer? Yeah, yeah. right, right. So the right buffer is something you, you have no visibility into, it's volatile. Uh, if the power is lost at that point, you're hosed. Uh, but they, they've thought of that. So what they do is on each one of these modules is a source of extra energy, a supercapacitor, and the guarantee is that the energy that's stored in the supercapacitor will be enough to commit all of the volatile state on the module into the non-volatile state. And so in effect, this whole thing, you can treat that boundary as a, a boundary of the system. Um, and I'm curiously, this is, uh, if you look through the literature, this is called Asynchronous Data Refresh, which is a name, I, I just cannot see how this is connected to that name, but you'll see ADR in the literature, ADR basically means once it hits the dim, you're done, it's safe. Um, so who needs some kind of more control? Is it the, the bandwidth of the DDR is higher than the bandwidth that actually requires the dim? Well, the DDR is sending right. There's back pressure from the DDR channel that says I can't take anything anymore, so then it'll sit in the right queue until, until the chip says I can do it, you send me some more. Okay, so that at least gives us a way of doing stuff. So let's step up. We have basic instructions, you know, we have a way of getting at the data, where do we go from there? Well, so one thing you might not want to rely on is being able to map stuff at the same address every time. There are a couple of issues with that. One is that OSs are generally a little reluctant to let you decide where stuff lives because they have decisions they want to make and, and they want some amount of freedom on doing that. Um, but a bigger problem is, suppose you have uh, two chunks of the system data in different places and uh, that were created independently and they both say, I would like to live at address 23. Uh, well, you, you know, how do you deal with that data? if it collides. So one of the things we're probably going to have to do on a regular basis is make sure that the contents of these uh, regions, persistent regions, is somehow either position independent, so they can be mapped anywhere, or relocatable and be linked after mapping. Uh, just like we do to code, right? So there's a sort of an analogous thing. So one, one approach is self-relative data, and there Pointers are not addresses, they're offsets. A pointer becomes an offset from the location that the pointer sits in. So a pointer to itself is zero, uh, and pointers to other places are positive or negative offsets from those. And that gives you a way of having position independent, position independence, just like we have relative branches in code. Um, now, if your language thinks zero is important, and allows things to point to themselves, you, you have a problem um, and you have to resolve it somehow. Uh, note that managed languages generally don't allow pointers to point to themselves, so this isn't a problem for those in C, it certainly is. The alternative is to do some kind of relocation. When you map the thing in, um, you know, it was mapped previously at some address, and so you go, oh, that's not where I want it, I want it somewhere else, let's go and fix up all of the the pointers, but there are a couple of caveats that, that you have to watch for. Um, if the relocation is eager and is going through the entire thing, fixing it up before, uh, before you can use it, that could be a very long time. Remember, the biggest system is 24 terabytes, and that's just the first release. Right? People are already talking about petabyte memories. But wandering through a petabyte, um, you know, fixing up pointers, even with you know, 100 CPUs, is going to take a while. Second is, what if the power goes down in the middle of that relocation? How are you going to make that reliable? That also is not the easiest thing to think about. Um, so if anybody does re relocation, it will probably be incremental on page at a time using page tricks. And you'll have to kind of maintain the property that each page can re be relocated atomically and incrementally. 
so that over time, you know, eventually they arrive where you want them to be, but they kind of dribble in as you make them. Uh, one problem with this is if you need simultaneous mappings, clearly you can't support the data living at two different addresses simultaneously if it's actually bound to a specific address. We also have the issue of a new kind of dangling pointer, uh, which is that uh, when the system restarts for whatever reason, the volatile memory has gone. And so if we have a pointer in persistent space that was pointing to something in volatile space, that pointer is now dangling because the volatile stuff, well, it's gone. Um, so the issue is how do we just prevent that or do we somehow have a way of dealing with it? Uh, and, you know, that's a design issue that every language and system designer will have to think about. Um, and it, it needs a name. Um, I can't think of a good name, but I'm calling it life, lifetime correctness, at least for the purposes of this, this talk. The idea that uh, we can only have volatile things pointing to persistent things, but not persistent things pointing to volatile things. So there are a number of possible mitigations for this, but they're all, they all have their issues. Uh, another non-obvious property of this particular system is that there's no way to directly observe the durability of any location in memory, because what we're using is the cache coherence protocol to communicate with the memory system. So you do a write, it lives in the cache. The fence tells you about visibility, uh, and maybe durability, even if, you give the, if you're generous and you take the durability thing, that's great if you did the right and you executed the fence, but what about some other arbitrary thread? When it looks at a particular memory location that comes from a mapped region, from a read, uh, from persistent memory, how can it tell whether that memory location is durable and will survive a restart, or whether it's coming from somebody else's cache? Short answer is it can't. There is, there is no way a priori to know that the only way you can you can know that is if the two threads cooperate and the uh, the writer in effect tells the reader via a side channel, okay, it's, it's durable now. You can you can rely on or rely on that for um, for you you know because that data will then propagate to other locations and that might become durable for the first piece of data becomes durable. So there, there are some interesting challenges here. Um, Bill Bridge, my colleague, is the one who pointed this problem out to me a while ago, and uh, I have a blog that I'm doing on a persistent memory, um, and the last, uh, last episode of book one, he wrote his piece describing this problem in some detail. But it is a challenge. Uh, one of the solutions he proposes is that if, if what you want to see is only durable values as a reader, the way to do that is that the writer has to, once they're assured the value is durable, copy to a volatile location, and then you look at the volatile locations on the assured that the stream of values in that location is only ever durable values. You'll never see a volatile value. Any questions? It's get, it's, we're getting into the kind of the intellectually challenging part of this. So if there's anyone gets stuck or has questions or better yet, objections, please feel free again. So zoom in. Why can't we use the trick of the one on the whole system to flush all the caches, all the... So, this property that I've described called ADR, which encapsulates a module in such a way that as soon as there's something arrives on the module that becomes persistent, there is a, a, a variant of that that's been proposed by many people called extended ADR. You can tell how much imagination the industry has as a whole. But the idea there is, there is an energy supply in the system that will flush all of the caches in the register. Well, it's, it's, so you can't just don't do cache flushes because you've got register state as well. Very few problems. It has to do a little bit about the ADI that's of the system. But the idea there is that there's enough power available that it's just all persistent. Well, whenever you're doing stuff, it's kind of get, as soon as you do an update, it's guaranteed. No vendor is currently talking about shipping a system like that, as far as I know. Just too much. I, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. If you know, if Oracle still had hard had hardware people, I'd go talk to them and ask them about this. But um, you know, it, 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 it requires some level of understanding of the, the mechanics here that I don't have, and 
I would need to talk to someone. But it, it's sort of the obvious way to solve this problem is to just, you know, not worry about all of these fences and things and, and just provide power. Um, but maybe it's just too much or it adds too much cost or there's another reliability. I, I don't know. Yes. So, maybe if I get to this, but I'm wondering what, what are the kinds of programs that I'm going to have to worry about? Because for example, right now, if I write a program where, that, where durability really matters, um, I don't do that by manually doing whatever the file system. What I do is I use a database system. I actually uh, write a kind of Good. 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 <laughs> yeah, uh, so I'll, I'll, I'm sort of working my way up the stack, which is, um, you know, what have we been given by the hardware people? How do we make use of it? Where do we have to go to get there? And that's the sort of the key question is um, if you're going to put stuff in RAM and SM durability, what, what, how do you need to surround that? What structures do you need to make sure that that's reliable? moment we have established practices uh, around block storage and file APIs to do that, um, what I'm suggesting is that we're going to need to develop similar kinds of practices for, um, for memory. Yeah, this one bit of, one question you asked is that at what point will the development of this technology affect things like the JavaScript, for example, like will the random people on the internet be able to write? Well, so, so so the, the goal here is to get everybody thinking about that because I think there is a missing plan to Who was first? I mean, so I don't know what he said, but it's the only issue that the market is that, you know, uh, to make a lot of processes sharing a memory map file. But then again, the, as in the unit said, the you know, standard said, when you have a memory map file, it might get synced on the disk at random interval. You still have to call FC. Yes. So at the end of the day, not a lot of stuff changes with. Well, no, because now, now what you have, and I'll, I'll get to this. So, so, so what is one of the big advantages here? You can do cache line write back expense, and it's durable. A microsecond after you did the write, it can be durable, and you can help. But you can't do that with any block of the technology because the path of the software. Way more than that. Well, like I can see that, but in that case, you know, FC just becomes a completely user space function, no calls to the kernel. Yeah, but the thing, the thing is, you, uh, FC is the entire file, right? Uh, Here it's a cache line for analyzing. Oh, okay, great. So, mm -hmm. so that's a big distinction. I mean, FC will exist and it will be really fast when the file is mapped onto all of this, but it will still. It, it will still be, in some sense, proportional to the max re region size, right? Unless, unless the other is keeping track of the durability itself, which I don't think anyone is likely to sign up for anytime soon. Yes? Um, I might be wrong, but to me it seems like this problem of the persistence, uh, cash line in order, uh, is mostly something I'd like to solve in the hardware, actually. So, uh, that's the standard dream of the software. <laughs> Sorry, but, you know, in, Intel has said, this is enough, your problem. The I mean, wall is now in our court. Yeah, you can probably just uh, have this uh, thing of uh, what you said, like flushing the caches of your persistence, mm -hmm. before you cover up, and that's something I wouldn't want to implement the software. Okay. Uh, so, if we should... Well, so the hardware guys don't want to implement it either, because actually it's just as hard in hardware. And it's actually not a trivial problem to solve this because our, our, the way we communicate uh, shared memory amongst threads is this cache coherence model. And the goal there is, is to make uh, visibility the explicit property you know, and to have rules around the memory model. And, but this is a different thing and it doesn't fit into that model in a clean way. And so you end up with these collisions mm -hmm. in the model. If someone sits down and rethinks what the model should look and does the right job, and then people build processes and memory systems that adhere to that model, then, then life will be different. But that's, you know, that's one of the PhD topics at the end, is to start that process going. Okay, so in the current form, what are the advantages? Why would you get this stuff and use it? You know? So the, the, the main benefit is reduced startup time. Uh, when you restart your program, the data that you would previously have had to read from block storage into memory to initialize the state of your program now can just be in memory when you attach. 
And so the startup time can come down really sharply, obviously that's proportional in some sense to volume, and um, it means that availability of particular systems should go up because you know, the time that they're down and a restart is, is, should be seriously decreased. So that's a big advantage for uh, systems that rely on uh, high availability. Uh, as I mentioned, there's this reduced update latency, uh, which gets data groups people really excited because that's the kind of thing they've been having to work around all of this time is when we write stuff to, to block storage, it takes forever and a day to get there. And meanwhile, you have to either tr track that it's in flight and figure out how you're going to accommodate a crash or wait until it's done or whatever. And then the sort of economic benefit is we get higher capacity and denser storage and lower cost of it, which is an important thing because many systems are limited by capacity density or, or cost. And this, this expands the envelope. From the point of view of a longer term, kind of what, what might be a plausible dream of how this stuff gets used. Um, so um, we compute using in-memory representations, right? And when, when we store, we change representation typically. So uh, our in-memory representation is usually not the same as the external representation in storage. So we need to write code to do the transformation. We need to make a copy of the thing that was in memory out onto the, the disk or the SSD. And it takes both well, time and energy and uh, effort to write all of that code and debug it, etc. And so, so one dream is: can we eliminate the second representation? Can we just compute the memory, persist the memory, and be done and save all of this hassle? Yes. Yeah, but maybe that's not a good idea. I mean, uh, okay. dream, 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 yeah. dream. It's, I'm queuing the rest of the thing here. <laughs> give, give me a chance. Give me a chance. Give me a chance. Don't interrupt the movie. But that's a bit spoiler for the end. <laughs> okay, so it's actually an old idea, very old. Uh, you can see it at least going back into the 60s in Lisp systems where people used to persist the image of what they were working on. Smalltalk has had it since the 70s. Um, it has clear advantages in some cases. Uh, there was a body of work uh, starting in the 80s with uh, some, some work done in uh, Glasgow and St Andrews in Scotland on. Um, how to modify languages for persistence explicitly. This is a good place to start. A body of literature, people like Tony and I went to conferences and workshops and stuff around all of this. It kind of all faded away uh, in, the, back to life. in the 90s. And now, now it's coming back to life. That's fine. So there's, you know, there's a body of literature to go back and look on. This is, what, one of the things this is, it's really, it's a developer's dream of NVRAM. Because if you look at all of these properties, other than the kind of the operational properties, they're, they're about saving programming effort. Uh, what, what do users care about? It's not this stuff, except maybe the time and energy. Mm -hmm. The user's dream of NVRAM is uh, what, what if we could just put all of our software in RAM? Uh, and, and you know, how fast would it start up if it was just right there immediately, it didn't have to go through mapping and uh, and loading and linking. Uh, what, what if we could have uh, processes that persisted, right? You pull the plug uh, and pull it, plug it back in again and it just carried on from where you left off. If you, if you talk to uh, some of the old guys, older than me, at least, they talk about things like uh, process control systems that use core storage, you know, like a, a mini computer in a sawmill with a really flaky power supply. And the power would go out, come back on, and the thing would just keep running to pick up from where it left off, because the state was non-volatile. Um, so there's all sorts of potential benefits going down that path. Um, as you will see in the rest of this talk, uh, we're going to have to think much more about doing stuff in a transactional manner, in a recoverable manner. And one possibility is that we improve the reliability of our software, thinking more carefully about failure models, and containing failures, and that would be good for end users. And supply them with ways of restarting that are very selective rather than the current all or nothing practice. Uh, but in all of this, we have some interesting security challenges. But think about uh, the prospect of putting all of your files only a load or store away from malware. Um, it's kind of a scary prospect. So, so they turning this stuff into a, a reality is going to require. Uh, 
bunch of steps and what I'm going to just spend do with the rest of this session and the beginning of next is talk about some of those things. Yes? Is there also a big security issue about uh, if you compute everything in person to run, you don't have to wait anymore to just flush it. For instance, you have your security keys in RAM. Okay. Well, they're persistent and everyone can unplug or... Well, so that has at least been addressed uh, at the current level in that the data in an Intel module can be encrypted at rest. Yeah. So there's an encryption yeah. path and when you plug the thing and pull the thing out, you know, and take it somewhere else and you don't know the, the unlock key, you should be able to get access to the data. So they haven't at least gone that far. Yeah. But it's you know, slower. So no, it's, it's built into the memory control. And also, where does the key reside? If you have your RAM, which is So it's, uh, I can't ask it because I haven't looked very closely. But, you know, they've done something in this direction. When, it's, when this stuff gets in the hand of people who want to probe it, we'll see how good that thing is. Yes. Okay, that's a good, perfect action. Okay, so, um, so both the users and the developers dream involve taking some other part of the way we currently store things uh, via files and the associated software and replacing them by, or eliminating or replacing them by persistent memory. Eliminating either to save the complexity of the dual representation or replacing to gain some other property like speed or get latency. So uh, this is a fairly fundamental change to the way we think about building software and hence we have to think about uh, why we do what we do and what properties we would need to maintain uh, to continue to be successful. So uh, one good question to ask is, why do we store things? Why do we put things in block storage? Uh, and I came up with these ideas, you might have other, other suggestions. You know, one is the obvious one that we've been talking around so far, which is so that the data stay around, you take the power away and put it back, and it's all still there. But that's actually only one of a number of reasons uh, one reason we store is to have a record of how the data used to be at some point in time. So, so archival or backup or auditing all require stuff to be in non-volatile storage. We also uh, use the block APIs to share things. Uh, at one level of granularity, we might have multiple processes accessing the same file, say. Uh, and that gives us the way of sharing without opening up our memory space to the other process, which involves a lot more uh, complexity and, and potentially risk. So, so we need some way of thinking about that too. And then the sort of the long distance of the way of sharing is I'm going to send you a copy. I'm going to copy my data and put it in and wrap it in a file. And if you can access it by a remote file system or I'll stick it in an email attachment or whatever. And we're still going to need all of these mechanisms uh, around, you know, we're not just going to all compute a single universal address space that you know, starts at zero and, and goes up to, you know, there's some, some, some computer sitting on a planet, you know, Mars or whatever. Uh, we're still going to have to partition the world up and have some ways of sharing and controlling our sharing. Uh, and uh, the persistent memory relays in its basic form only addresses the first of these. Right? It doesn't automatically give you a solution to the other things. You need to either use your existing solutions or adopt new solutions in the case that your data that you've persisted are not in a file. They're in a, they're in a, a, a persistent memory region. Um, know that um, it's unlikely to be the case that one single representation is going to solve all problems. You know, if you look at storage representations, because we don't compute on those representations directly, we take advantage of that fact to achieve other properties which are desirable. So the representation of persistent data out in storage might be a lot simpler than the in-memory computational version of that, which would probably be augmented with things like indexes and other structures and caches to make various operations really fast. When it gets out to storage, Often we, we eliminate all of that stuff uh, with the goal of having the external storage be as simple as possible. And if you kind of drive down that path some more, the next step you get to is uh, your representation is both independent, you know, is independent of language or machine architecture or operating.
operating system, or all of those things. Um, and uh, RAM representations usually are not. If you keep going down that path, you end up with things like uh, external file formats, which are well documented. Generally speaking, I think people's file formats have a high level standard of documentation and their own memory representations. Uh, and the ultimate end point of that is we all agree collectively as an industry on a file format and we standardize it. Right? There are plenty of standardized file formats. I'm hard put to think of any standardized data structures, you know, ISO or hash map. Number nine. Okay. Um, just a final caveat is um, size limitations. You know, at the moment we work on the assumption that when we put stuff out to disk, if we run out of disk, we can plug in another one and we can keep adding them almost indefinitely, one way or another. That will never be the case with non volatile memory, simply because it's RAM, and RAM has electrical, physical limitations that are used to guarantee speed. So physical distances have to be below a certain level to make sure that latencies are guaranteed. Uh, electrical characteristics restrict things like fanning of buses and things, and so RAM has a hard limit. When you buy a system, there is so much you can plug in, and then you run out of address line. It doesn't matter if electrical, you have more capacity. Once you're out of address, it's that it. So size and size and speed are opposed in this, and the industry has basically said something, you know, speed has to be guaranteed at a certain level, and I don't think it's going to go away anytime soon. Now, people have worked on ways of extending memory arbitrarily. Oh, so there was a bunch of work in the 1980s on something called distributed shared memory. And it's been revived a little bit now through a consortium called Gen Z, or Z if you prefer. Um, and the idea of this consortium is to provide memory operation semantics across networks and to build uh, high speed networking interfaces to, to make that possible. Um, we'll see in a little bit why that might be a good thing to do. But uh, in amongst all of these dreams, there is a nightmare. Does anybody recognize this gentleman? <laughs> I don't know whether that's, it does the sound come out through the projector. Uh, does anybody know what he's about to say? Is it Bob Sending or something? Let's see if it plays. Okay. So, this is, uh, who recognizes this? Okay, um, so this is a comedy show that ran in the UK uh, a while ago now called the IT Crowd, and it was about a bunch of people who were doing frontline IT support. And the standard response when anybody called in with a problem was, "Have you tried turning it off and on again?" And in fact, it, it said so many times in the uh, show that the YouTube clip here glues together about 50 of those into one <laughs> YouTube clip. But um, so have you tried turning it off and on again? Um, who in this room has restarted an application or a machine to resolve the problem successfully in the last month? Okay, let me invert it. Who in this room has not restarted a machine in the last month? So, okay. Uh, who's done that in the last week? Last day? Last hour? No. Okay. Can anybody imagine, literally anybody who uses a computer who does not know to try this, other than the people who call into the IT group? <laughs> <laughs> so, they clearly work, because we do it all the time, or at least we, we believe they do something. The, the question is why? What does this do? What problem does this solve? I'm going to leave it to a student. <laughs> Because effectively you start from a clean state. You, you haven't gone into a state, you know, where something by body has occurred and etc. etc. Okay. But there's two kinds of state. There's volatile state and there's non-volatile state. What are the implications for each kind? Well, if it's non-volatile state, most likely your hard you know, and you restart, your hard disk has uh, you know has been corrupted or anything like that. So you can't even restart. Right. 
So there is the no. When we restart, and we restart all the time, that means we have some kind of corruption in volatile state. And yet our non-volatile state was correct. And we recover from the non-volatile state and rebuild the volatile state. We have lots of different reasons why we restart. Okay, we have uh, termination problems, power loss. Who's actually encountered a real power loss of a system in the middle of while they were doing something? How many of those people were in North America at the time? <laughs> okay. Uh, so this is something Europeans don't know anything about because the power system here is pretty reliable, but in other parts of the world, uh, power loss is, is a little bit more common, but still not very common. Uh, unrecoverable memory error leading to termination, no bus fault or don't. Yeah, common. Accidental termination by <laughs> operator or external agent. Oh, actually, <laughs> control C, now I was aiming for control C. Uh, fatal bug. <laughs> and, you know, how, how common is this relative to all of these others? I would argue that this is probably the most common of these four. And then we have the non terminating uh, failures, things like infinite loops and line locks and deadlocks, which usually translate into the non accidental termination by the operator. Uh, we can get data corruption of the data. Um, caused by a bug, we can get memory leaks, which eventually slow down our system and we have to restart them. All of these issues are handled successfully by restart, except data corruption and for persistent storage. All of them. How well is this going to work when all of that state is in non volatile memory? Then yeah, we just have some kind of hard reboots procedure. A what? A kind of hard reboots procedure. A hard reboot, yeah, like format your disk. Uh, <laughs> so if you still have some uh, personal storage like spinning disk or SSD or whatever, you can always like dump the OS parts. Um, okay, so so suppose we uh, we go down the developer's dream path and we accept that we don't want to have an external representation because that saves us a bunch of programming effort. So, uh, if that's the dream, uh, how do we actually accomplish that? So, I'm going to talk a little bit about, uh, about that issue, mostly in the next session. Um, this, is, this is where the problem lies. Oh, hardware failures. How long have I got them for that? Yeah, okay, so, so uh, real hardware actually fails. Um, I mean, it's actually completely uneconomic to try and build super high levels of reliability in hardware. So for example, in DRAM, um, ionizing radiation, which comes from the rest of the universe, so it's, it's kind of hard to eliminate, um, uh, can flip the state of a bit, and that gets increasingly likely the fewer electrons you have on an individual bit. And, and uh, the way we deal with this currently is we have a redundancy in the memory system, typically, that can detect through error codes whether one bit has changed uh, spontaneously like that. So on a consumer device, you might have the parity check, and on an enterprise-grade hardware, you have a, a ECC bit. Uh, and these events are not rare, right? If you have a data center full of RAM, this is happening all the time in the data center, you know, little isolated pockets. Uh, and if you put the data center in Denver, as uh, some did years ago, uh, elevation 6,000 feet, that much closer to the source of cosmic background radiation. Um, they're even more frequent than that. So, um, so Intel has not published any failure mode uh, or error rate data for this underlying technology, so we don't know. Um, uh, certainly the modules will obviously seek to try and accommodate that. Uh, existing interfaces for DRAM errors are used to report errors in Optane, so whatever interrupts, traps, etc. were present are the same ones that are used for Optane. And so, um, if there's an uncorrectable error, you know, in the current state, we kill, we restart, right? We flush out our volatile state, the DRAM gets reinitialized, and uh, all is good. Um, in the, uh, when our data are in non-volatile RAM, we 
we're going to have to find it somewhere else, which means we have to put it somewhere else, and we have to know how to get it and install it. So, uh, some programming required, which we currently do not habitually do as an interface. So I think I'm going to break the deck and uh, continue tomorrow. Thank you for the last questions. Yeah, we have some questions tomorrow. Then you can always grab me on the code. Yes. So does uh, this technology already solve this Amdos event or are we not doing So if you plug these modules in and you do our true this is an IO channel for storage, yes, absolutely it does. Absolutely. Uh, the, the bandwidth is, you know, only a fraction of that, uh, you know, a high fraction of DRAM bandwidth, and it's uh, you're plugging lots of modules to get uh, more power and more. So yeah, the imbalance is, is restored. Yes. So you, you've scared it um, because I think, okay, we have all these modules that we think we should use, but mostly can't, and so that probably models will be too far apart from the head, and this is going to make it more complex. Is this going to give us capabilities that you think that will mostly go and use? Initially, I think there will be a wave of clever, financially motivated people who have a good reason to use this stuff and will make it work no matter what uh, the industry that Silvan used to be in, which is basically dealing with all the money in the world. <coughs> And if you can tap into all the money in the world and get some of it, these are not fatal problems, right? I mean, there are ways of yeah. it. Um, it will slowly percolate out. Uh, the area that I am focused on is how does this affect the average program? What does the typical, you know, what if you think of someone coming up through uh, an undergraduate class, what are they going to have to learn? How are we going to teach them? Or, if you find existing programmers, how do they have to change their thinking and their practices to use this? What kind of tooling, what kind of languages are needed? Uh, I think eventually we will collectively get there, but it could be a sort of a decadal, multi decadal effort to get there. Uh, and in the meantime, I would expect there to be some real disasters. <laughs> just, it just seems inevitable. I'm not that optimistic, though. <laughs> 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 <laughs>